When these things started cropping up, people said, this could be a threat for a lot of different reasons to governments or national security. What are we going to do about this? And for a while, there were calls to ban it. There were calls to certainly ban cryptography, right? Um, but eventually, you, you found the government embracing it, saying this is a great innovation. And then nowadays, they, of course, use it. And everything uh, that the government does is, is encrypted. It's, it's considered best practices. I mean, obviously, it's our hope that regulators see the potential and the innovation here and to be a leader in the space, because obviously that could create a lot more GDP and prosperity for, for our country and around the world. Welcome to our latest episode. Today, we explore Fidelity's pioneering journey in the realm of cryptocurrency, dating back to 1999, long before Bitcoin even existed. Discover how Fidelity's Center for Applied Technology led them to early Bitcoin mining in 2015, their innovative attempts to use Bitcoin in everyday transactions, and the genesis of Fidelity Digital Assets. Join us as we uncover the history, challenges, and future of Bitcoin and digital assets through the lens of one of the world's leading financial institutions. To go back to where their story started with, with Bitcoin and digital assets, you actually have to go back to 1999, before any of this even existed. And that is when Fidelity started something called the Fidelity Center for Applied Technology. And this was kind of a pure R&D center. And so they're, they're involved in all kinds of things, you know, AI, quantum computing, virtual reality. But of course, they came across Bitcoin way back in 2014, or maybe even a little earlier. They get their hands dirty. They, they like to play with the tech, experiment with it, try it out. So one of the first things they did was they started mining Bitcoin in the office around 2015, I believe. And the other thing they did was they did some pilot programs where they said, okay, let's actually try to use this. And so they gave some wallets and Bitcoin to, to certain employees and tried to have them pay for their lunch down in the cafeteria with it. Now, wow. <laughs> you can imagine how this went years ago before Lightning Network and anything like that, waiting at least 10 minutes or more for a confirmation. And sure. how do you do a return or a chargeback and all this kind of stuff? So I, I don't think that went too well at the time, but it, at least they were trying it. There's still some people at Fidelity today who who think back of how much they paid in Bitcoin for that salad and how much it'd be worth today and that sort of right. thing. But um, it just shows that they they have a commitment to trying things out. And so back to the mining portion, they started mining it, and eventually they realized if we want to hold these Bitcoin that we've we've mined, how are we going to do that? And they looked at the marketplace and they said, "There's no enterprise grade institutional solution for this. There's no custody, right? Mm -hmm. And so that is the first product that they they went out to build. We've built our custody solution from scratch, and that is the core product of Fidelity Digital Assets today. So Fidelity Digital Assets came out of FCAT in 2018. It was officially launched. And core product is still custody. And since then, we've added other services on top of that. There's an execution platform for buying and selling. We can do collateral, tri-party collateral, if people want loans against it, that sort of thing. Um, so that's kind of the history of, of where we are. The, the main question we wanted to tackle that we put in the beginning is people hear about Bitcoin. Obviously, it's a new technology. It's a breakthrough technology. And most traditional investors hear technology and they put on these lenses or frameworks of Facebook replacing MySpace. We see the iPhone replacing BlackBerry, right? And so I, I was there. I was a tech investor. Those were the lenses I put on as well. Uh, but it was through a lot of other writing, standing on the shoulders of, of giants in this space, as you know, that really got me to look at this more from an economic perspective and the monetary perspective. And so once you come around to view Bitcoin, the asset, the token, as an emerging monetary good, not just the technology of the network or the payment system, then you start to realize this, this focuses on decentralization and security. And those are the core, the core things you want in a monetary good. And then falling back on my economics, you go through the properties of what make good money, portable, divisible, homogenous, easily transportable. Bitcoin fulfills all those things too. So now you've got a superior form of money. Anyone that tries to, quote, improve upon this is going to make a trade-off. They're going to make a trade-off in terms of that decentralization or that security. And so that's why we think you have to put Bitcoin in a completely separate bucket from everything else. So again, we write to inv institutional investors. Our main point is you need to have the right lens or framework on. So view Bitcoin as the first and view Bitcoin as emerging monetary good. And then if you want to look at other stuff, that's fine. But make sure you view that more like a venture capital bet, 
something that's going to have a lot more competition, something that's making trade-offs, something that needs to find their product market use case fit. Can you dig into that just a little bit more? Because I think people look at the space and even big institutions still conflate Bitcoin with crypto. They kind of, uh, you know, lump it all together in the same category. The core properties of Bitcoin being the most secure, being the most decentralized. And for those who know the, the blockchain trilemma, those are two of the three characters. The third one is, is speed and Bitcoin's notoriously slow. Right? So maybe that's a, a challenge on the payment side, but in terms of the actual monetary side, who cares about speed? What, what good is speed? What good is a better payment network if you don't have the security and the decentralization? Bitcoin's the only credibly neutral one, right? If you're talking about an emerging monetary good, it's got to be neutral. Otherwise, you can turn to a founder or an organization or a company or a country, right? And Bitcoin is really the only credibly neutral one in the space. And so if something will survive, and not saying it, it will, but if it were to, it would almost have to be, or you'd certainly want it to be neutral like this. Before you had everyone on a, on a telephone and you want to add a feature, you had to upgrade it for everyone on the system. So like caller ID, everyone had to upgrade to caller ID and you had to push it out to all the systems and everything like that. Uh, so it was very cumbersome. Now with the internet and, and voice over IP, all you have is at the base layer, a protocol that sends packets of, of data information around. It's pretty dumb, right? It just says, okay, here's a piece of information. I know it has to go here. And that's all it does. And that's all it needs to do. And then if people want to add features onto it, they can add it on the outside of the network, the outside mm -hmm. nodes. So you can add things like smartphone apps that can do all kinds of things more than caller ID, right? And so if you allow innovation to happen at the edges without mm -hmm. screwing up the core, that's what allows for, for flexibility and for this to grow. And what I see Bitcoin doing is people are rightfully saying, don't change Bitcoin core. Don't, don't mess with it. Let it be a dumb, slow system, to put it bluntly, because that's all we want it to do. All we want the network to do is verify how many coins are out there and move the, the, the messages around that say transfer this coin to this coin. That's all we want it to do. And if you want to build stuff on top of it, well, be my guest. But, but don't screw up everything else. Let the innovation happen at the edges. Now, the difference, though, with the internet and phones is that you can actually kind of own a piece of this protocol, right? If you are buying Bitcoin asset, you're owning a piece of the network, so to speak. You have to look at the whole adoption curve. And if you really think, if, if our thesis turns out to be true, not saying it will, but if it were to turn out to be true that Bitcoin is undergoing a monetism, it's becoming accepted as a monetary good as a store of value. Well, over the long time and long enough time horizon, then it's never too late, right? Because it's just going to be one point in this adoption. Now, there's of course huge swings in between of one to four or five years, right? That that you're all well aware of. But again, if you have a long enough time horizon, these are just waves of adoption. And each time we go higher and then we pull back, but the pullback is higher than the last low. And so I think that's how you have to think of it. Mm -hmm. uh, people buy real estate as a way to save for the retirement. People buy stocks and bonds and stuff like that. So right. if, if people even just allocate a portion to this potential, uh, that gives you an idea of how far we have to go yet. I would look at a stock, like say, as just an example, you make your thesis, you say, it looks good at this value. And then something happens and the stock drops 50% or whatever it is. It's a gut check and it's a check to say, is it on sale? Should I buy more? Is something irrational going on? Or is the market correct in that my thesis is broken? Is it not intact anymore? So people are, are rational to question when it drops, is something broken here? Is something wrong? And we clearly saw with a lot of other crypto projects that something was terribly broken, right? It was broken from the start. But if you look at Bitcoin, nothing has changed in that thesis. Right? And if you were to show me all the on-chain metrics that don't have to do with price, I would not believe we are currently in a bear market, still down 60%, because every fundamental shows mm -hmm. that the thesis is still intact. Our active address is growing. Is the hash rate going up? Mm -hmm. All of these things are still going up. So to me, the biggest risk as an investor is, do people become apathetic about this? Are they leaving the network? Are they abandoning it for something else or have they lost belief in it? And, and so far, the answer is no. Whether the price is X or whether the price is 10X of that to us doesn't really matter because the core thesis we're talking about is making a core allocation of your portfolio, holding it for the long term, and 
riding this adoption trend. I like to zoom out and look at history and, and monetary history as well. And it gives you a really big picture of, of the history of money, right? And so one thing I'll point out is gold has been a money for millennia, right? And it was only recently where we started to get away from that because fiat currency offered things that gold didn't. Like, let's be intellectually honest here. It's hard to send gold around the world, paper money and digital money, you can, right? So there's reasons why it went that way. If you look at just the past 40, 50 years, ever since we went completely off the gold standard, one, that's been a very short time of history. So I don't think people know how this is going to end up where the entire world has been on a completely free floating fiat system, right? And so it'll be interesting to see how, how it evolves. The only thing I can point to as maybe a, a parallel or proxy is uh, gold used to be $35, $40 an ounce and it was fixed, right? And then we went off the gold standard and then it also became legal to own gold again for U.S. citizens. A lot of people forget that it wasn't legal until the 70s to actually own it as a personal citizen. And what happened? Gold had to go through a monetization process. It had to go from $35, $40 an ounce. It ran all the way up in the inflation of the 70s to over $800 an ounce, crashed back down to $100, $200 an ounce. And now we're climbing back up to 2000 So the U.S. dollar did not did not go away. It it developed alongside the U.S. dollar. So that's one scenario where you could see Bitcoin go through this monetization proce process and, and develop alongside the U.S. dollar. And then, of course, there's others who say, no, eventually uh, it's such a superior form. It's going to replace everything. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not, I'm not sure on that. <laughs> and I try to look at, at proxies in history. And the one I come back to is uh, the invention of the internet. When these things started cropping up, people said, uh, this could be a threat for a lot of different reasons uh, to governments or national security. What are we going to do about this? And for a while, there were calls to ban it. There were calls to certainly ban cryptography, right? Um, but eventually you, you found the government embracing it, saying this is a great innovation. And then nowadays they, of course, use it and everything uh, that the government does is, is encrypted. It's, it's considered best practices. I mean, obviously it's our hope that regulators see the potential and the innovation here and to be a leader in the space, because obviously that could create a lot more GDP and prosperity for, for our country and around the world. Bitcoin's highly correlated to the supply of money and certainly the rate of growth of money, as well as real interest rates. So if treasury yields are screaming higher right now, and I can get more money in a, in a quote, risk-free asset with a, with a treasury, and I can now get a positive real yield because inflation has come down, that's looking a lot more attractive than Bitcoin, which yields nothing, right? So let's be honest there. Over the past two or three months, I've actually been very surprised that Bitcoin has held up this well because real yields keep getting higher and Bitcoin's kind of held its own. And so the trillion dollar question, of course, is, well, does Bitcoin catch up and drop to match the increase in real yields? Or is Bitcoin sniffing something else out on the macro front? Personally, I think it might be sniffing out more of the massive structural fiscal deficits we're experiencing right now. Right? In terms of the, the flight to safety, people have looked at it at Bitcoin as a high growth, high risk, high beta asset. They lump it in with, with high growth tech stocks. And that is how it's traded. So I say I can pound the table all day telling people about the unique value proposition of Bitcoin as a bear at asset with a, a fixed monetary supply and that it's actually uh, higher quality in terms of its its safety and visibility and transparency than a lot of other financial instruments out there. I can say that, but at the end of the day, traders were trading it like a high growth tech stock. So if we decouple from that narrative, that will be very interesting, right? Because I think it will mm -hmm. mark a turning point in the realization of these people saying, ah, Bitcoin is different. Bitcoin is different from all of this, these other things. From their early mining endeavors to the development of sophisticated custody solutions, we've seen how Fidelity navigated the uncharted waters of cryptocurrency. We also delved into the broader implications of Bitcoin's role as an emerging monetary good, its distinct properties, and the future trajectory of digital currencies alongside traditional financial systems. If you want to hear the whole conversation, go over to Natalie's channel to watch the entire interview. We've linked it in the description below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more in-depth analyses and expert insights. Goodbye, and see you in the next episode.